I'm really, really excited about our next panel, uh, where we're going to look at uh, financial surveillance in a cashless society. We have a set of people who are on the front lines of looking at crypto, Web3, and civil liberties. Um, these are really people who are fighting for the future of our, our data and our privacy. And we have the hook. Well, excited to have everyone here today. Uh, we are, our topic is financial surveillance in a cashless society, but do we think a cashless society is a surveillance society? Maybe. I don't know. We'll get into it. I know these people have a lot of opinions. So um, just by way of introduction, um, you know, obviously financial records can be deeply personal and revealing. Uh, they contain a trove of sensitive information about our personal lives, our beliefs, our affiliations, um, and how we interact with and regulate and maintain these records really has to be done with careful consideration regarding their effect on privacy and speech and innovation, and this is what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so I'm joined today by Marta Belcher, who is the uh, chair of the Filecoin Foundation, the great sponsor of this awesome decentralized web gateway event. So super excited to have Marta here. She also works um, as counsel to EFF, you know, in one of her money side hustles. So um, super excited to have her. Um, Sheila Warren, oh my gosh, amazing. Um, she is the CEO of the Crypto Council for Innovation. Uh, Jake Chervinsky at the very end there. Sorry to skip over your Jillian. I'm going by the order in my notes. Um, he is the head of policy at the Blockchain Association, um, uh, where I also work. And so super excited to have Jake here today. Uh, and then Jillian York, who is the director of International Freedom of Expression at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So please join me in welcoming this all-star panel today. So I know um, time is short, we have a lot to cover, but why don't we start with uh, Marta here. So why is, it in, why is it so important that we have a mechanism for anonymous transactions in the digital world? Just to set the stage. Yeah, so you know, I think that there is this myth that privacy is bad and that tools that enable privacy and anonymity are illegal or enable Ill illegal activity. And I think that that is fundamentally just a, a very important misunderstanding. Privacy is absolutely critical to civil liberties, as is the ability to transact anonymously. And the example I always give when I talk about this is this really powerful picture I saw during the Hong Kong protests. So there are these pictures of, of the pro-democracy protesters um, and they're in line at the subway station and they're in these really long lines because they wanted to use cash uh, to pay for their subway tickets rather than electronic purchases um, because they didn't want those electronic purchases to place them at the scene of the protest. And so for me, that really underscores that a cashless society really is a surveillance society and the importance of financial transactions being able to be anonymous for civil liberties. All right, well, why don't we hand it over next to Sheila and Jake uh, to touch upon an incredibly timely topic, which is Russia and Ukraine. Because we've been seeing, because both Jake and Sheila and I work with policymakers uh, trying to sort of educate them and uh, dispel any misunderstandings, which, you know, there's a lot of those, um, and uh, in advance good policies in this space. but. Um, you know, I think what's interesting is we've seen, I think, a fairly small subset of lawmakers that, that really want to shut down access to people around the world to, to have access to crypto transactions. So, Sheila, I'd love to get um, kind of your thoughts on particularly how sort of the crypto industry and sort of the on-ramps and off-ramps are thinking about compliance with sanctions. And then, you know, we'll hand it over to Jake because I know you've had a lot of if you guys don't follow Jake on Twitter, you should. Um, he's got a lot of, lot, of, lot of thoughts on this as well. So why don't we start with you, Sheila? 
Well, let's just start by landing the primary point, which is what a terrible idea. So cutting off access to crypto transactions anywhere in the world is just a fundamentally terrible idea for myriad reasons, um, not the least of which is that it's basically impossible to segregate and isolate by broad category anything. So if you look at geographic distribution, you say, for example, which we heard, quite a bit, we all heard in the beginning of this of this invasion, uh, we gotta cut off every wallet address that's you know located in Russia in any fashion. Well, okay, that's a terrible idea because again, how are you articulating or determining what the purpose of that transaction is going to be? How are you ensuring that you're actually not cutting off access to humanitarian assistance? There's plenty of documentation and evidence around the tremendous outpouring of support from the crypto community, but from others using crypto rails to provide very needed humanitarian assistance. And essentially, we've seen the Ukrainian government crowdfund a war defense, which, I mean, we should pause on for a moment because it's staggering development in the evolution of crypto and the understanding of the use cases and what can be done with it. So, um, so yeah, I think there's just the fundamental, Kristen, as you noted, there's a lot of misunderstanding and misperception about uh, what happens here and what, what is done. And I'll just land one further point before handing over to Jake to go into, I think, more detail on this. But one thing we heard a lot of was like, well, this is, of course, going to be the immediate tool used by Russian oligarchs to avoid, you know, sanctions. And of course, that makes absolutely no sense if you're familiar with crypto because of the amount of liquidity you'd be looking to move and the traceability of that, any transaction, et cetera. So we were able to, I, I do think all of us were able to get in there and land very compelling evidence that that made absolutely no sense, which was really heard. What's been disappointing is seeing how, even though we know policymakers are on board with this position and understand it, a lot of mainstream media isn't quite there yet. So we're actually seeing in parallel deep understanding, I would say, quite deep technical understanding even by national security personnel, but then simultaneously op-eds and others that are still trying to land this point about, you know, sanctions evasion that actually doesn't make any sense. But, you know, over to you, Jake. Yeah, so uh, and there's been a lot of concern about crypto being used for sanctions evasions. Those concerns, I will just say, are totally unfounded. So let me explain a little bit. And I think partly this goes back to what Marta was saying about people using the concept of privacy or anonymity as sort of just a scare tactic to make people feel like, oh, if it's anonymous, it must be bad. And that's not the case when it comes to crypto and sanctions. So when it comes to sanctions, the main impact of sanctions is in stopping people in the Western world from doing business with people in Russia. It does not matter what medium of exchange you want to use if you are an American citizen and you want to do business with Russia, you are not allowed to do that, right? You cannot sell them goods, you cannot provide them services, you can't do business with them in any way, whether you're using dollars or gold or seashells or Bitcoin or anything else. So the impact of sanctions is not really affected in any way by crypto. The fact that there is an alternative payment system does not really give sanctioned Russian parties a way to evade sanctions. Nonetheless, we've had all these fears that come up because there is sort of this stigma around privacy that, oh, the Russian oligarchs will be able to get away with doing business with people who would otherwise be prohibited from those uh, those transactions just because there is privacy in that system. And that's also just not true, right? First of all, there's no reason to think that an American company that is legally prohibited from doing business with a Russian oligarch is going to do that just because they feel like their transaction might be private, right? If you want to send machine parts to Russia, you can't really do that privately. That's, that's like not something that Bitcoin helps you get away with or any other type of, of crypto asset. The other thing is, um, the liquidity in the crypto ecosystem, as, as Sheila was mentioning, just isn't deep enough for an entire nation state to run their entire economy. Maybe someday that'll change, but at this moment, that's just not a real concern. And so this is something that we have to deal with a lot when we're working on crypto policy is pushing back against these sort of very vague, maybe not even good faith concerns about crypto, right? Some of this might come back to people who just don't like what we're working on and want to find ways to try to attack it by telling them the truth about what's actually going on and what the technology actually does and does not do. Yeah, I mean, I think I saw something about Russia has put aside something like $650 billion for this advance on Ukraine. And if you look at like ruble trading pairs on crypto exchanges in Russia, it's a like fraction of that. And so they just simply can't do what they need to do. They're, like the liquidity just isn't there. So um, no, I think it's, I think it's super interesting. Um, Jillian, why don't we turn to you? Um, I would love to hear just sort of generally um, about the value 
of decentralization and how it can help protect civil liberties. Um, but maybe more specifically, also talk about the connection between financial surveillance and censorship. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, I think as all of you know, most of the platforms that you use, whether we're talking about financial platforms or your, you know, social media platforms, your internet service providers, et cetera, are centralized. These are, you know, they operate on the business model of surveillance capitalism. Um, and as we know, surveillance and censorship go hand in hand. If you're being watched, you're not going to feel free, right? And so when we're looking at this, um, you know, from the, just the general perspective of intermediaries, we have to look at it as decentralization takes away that central, you know, that sort of central control system and gives you more freedom and more power over what you can do and say. And so this translates into the financial arena, um, but as well as, you know, throughout the, the other internet platforms that you use. Now, financial intermediaries, um, be it credit card systems or payment providers like PayPal or Venmo also are deeply interlinked with all of these systems that you use. And so these they, they hold um, sort of undue influence over what you can see and say online. So I'll talk a little bit about that now. Um, I've, I've worked a lot more on financial censorship than I have on surveillance, so this is great. So to give a couple of examples, um, last year, August of 2021, OnlyFans, which I think folks are probably familiar with, at least in theory, um, became very popular throughout the pandemic for people, um, both people who are working in the area of sex work, but also other uh, content creators, became very popular for people to sell their work. Um, and then OnlyFans last August said, we're not going to host sexual content anymore. Now this obviously, you know, kind of pulled the rug out from under a lot of people who'd become reliant on that platform. Now why did they do it? Well, they said that it was, I believe the quote was um, because of banking providers and other financial intermediaries, pressure from them. They didn't give any more detail than that, but that's a great example of how these platforms or how, uh, sorry, how these financial uh, platforms and intermediaries can kind of hold sway over freedom of expression. Um, another example, just to kind of turn the globe a little bit, go somewhere else in the world, um, PayPal refuses to operate in the Palestinian territories. Now, they don't give a reason for this. We've done a lot of work trying to convince them uh, as to why, and from all we know, it's you know some sort of legal interpretation around terrorism statutes. That is to say, they may have obligations toward cutting off certain people in the same way as sanctions, um, but that's still a minority of people within those territories, not the majority of citizens there. Uh, notably, they they do happily operate in Israel, including in the occupied territories. So <laughs> to give that as an example, you know, I think that that's another area where um, an American company is holding undue power over an entire people to you know, refuse services to them. Um, and so to link that back to financial surveillance, that's an area where if you're being watched in that way, if you're being censored in that way, you, you can't operate freely. And I think that this is what brings us to the importance of cryptocurrency. All right, you guys are answering so fast, we can slow it down now. I, I know we had to cut this short by 20 minutes, but <laughs> feel free to. Okay, I mean, as Jake, Jake and I last night were like, are you ready for this? And Jake's like, I could talk about this all day. So. Well, Marta and I can always talk about Fourth Amendment. <laughs> yes, we can. For an hour, so maybe we'll get there at some point. Um, all right, great. Well, why don't, um, let's bring it back to Marta for a second, um, because I do want to get, I mean, for those of you who were here earlier today, I obviously care very much about the policymaking element of this and um, you know how how do policymakers view this how can we change policies to support all of the work that people in this room are doing but Marta maybe you can walk us through a little bit of the history of the financial regulatory environment and and sort of help us understand why we're starting to see some of these conflicts which we'll get into in more detail uh, between the crypto world and the traditional uh, financial services world thanks Kristen so, you know, the Fourth Amendment in the United States balances the privacy and civil liberties interests of citizens with the reasonable, uh, legitimate needs of law enforcement by requiring that law enforcement goes and gets a warrant if they want information about a citizen, right? Um, so under the Fourth Amendment, you need to have reasonable cause and, and you need to have a judge that says, yes, you know, you can go get this information about a citizen, right? So with that in mind, how is it that we got to a place today where many of our financial transactions are turned over to the government by default en masse without a warrant? in a system of mass surveillance. Like, how did we get there? Well, the reason that we got there is something called the third party doctrine. 
So, so this sort of goes back to a case in the 1970s, U.S. v. Miller. Um, and this case was about the Bank Secrecy Act, or at least the Bank Secrecy Act as it was being uh, utilized at the time, um, which was um, you know, one of the ways in which uh, uh, law enforcement was getting, the government was getting access to bank records by default, uh, again, without a warrant. So that was a Supreme Court case where the Supreme Court in the 1970s said, well, you've given this information to a third party, to a bank. And so that means that you've lost your reasonable expectation of privacy in that information. And so that is the third party doctrine. Um, and that is the reason that the government is able to do this surveillance at a mass scale uh, without it being a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Now, a lot has happened since the 1970s. Um, and, and my view is that if we were to take this, this case back up to the Supreme Court today, it would actually come out very differently. Um, the reason for that is that in the, in the decades since Miller, um, there have been a series of Supreme Court decisions where the Supreme Court has said, you know, in the 1970s, the amount of information that you could get from someone from their bank records and from the information that they give to third parties is just absolutely minuscule compared to today, where you can't go a, literally a second, right, without information about your location, about your your transactions, um, about all this all this information being turned over to the government, uh, excuse me, turned over to third parties on a second by second basis, just by virtue of carrying around a cell phone, right? Um, and so the Supreme Court has started to recognize this and has started to chip away at the third party doctrine. Um, and so uh, in addition to that, the Bank Secrecy Act and the amount of financial surveillance that happens today uh, is greatly expanded beyond what was happening when the Supreme Court reviewed this in U.S. v. Miller. So, so my view is if this, if this case went back up, um, there would be a pretty good chance that, that it would actually lead to a lot less financial surveillance. And my view is the financial surveillance that's happening today is actually unconstitutional. All right, so we have this Bank Secrecy Act that has deputized these intermediaries for ostensibly a good cause, right? Um, but as you mentioned, there are some, some negative consequences. Um, Sheila, I want to go to you for a second because I know in your prior role at the World Economic Forum, but in your current role as well, I mean, I think one of the major issues when we look at cryptocurrency is what can this do to bring more people into the system? And, and can you talk a little bit about some of like what's the negative consequences of the Bank Secrecy Act and the potential for cryptocurrency to bring those who are outside of the system uh, and giving them access to financial services that they need? Yeah, probably my favorite question, as you well know. So I want to go back to something that Jillian was talking about with the example she was giving, because a lot of uh, the ways, what information is shared, the ability we as ordinary citizens have to engage in the banking system is really determined by the risk tolerance of these intermediaries, of these centralized actors. And that risk tolerance can change. It can change when a new general counsel takes over. It can change when a new CEO happens or when a new innovation is introduced, right? And so in some cases, like the PayPal Palestine example is kind of a classic example of overreach, of being very risk intolerant in a context um, for reasons that, again, are completely unknown. To, to most of us, despite many efforts, many of us try to figure it out. And so the Bank Secrecy Act, one of the consequences is that the banking, let's say the banking trail, like the route you can kind of take when money flows, it goes from a bank to a bank to a bank to a bank, right? It's not just a direct me to you the way that our beautiful system operates. There's no peer-to-peer -peer concept at all. It's banks talking to each other. And so as a result of the Bank Secrecy Act, without getting too technical about it, what has happened is that many banks based in the US, or based anywhere really, have declined to engage in relationships, they're called correspondent banking relationships, with banks in certain jurisdictions, which means it's not only impossible to use traditional banking systems or to kind of go to your bank account and have an easy path to get money to a remittance corridor, to get money to Guatemala, or to get money to uh, Venezuela, whatever it is, it's also really expensive to do it because you have to have so many hops and every time there's a hop from bank to bank, you're paying a fee. Okay, so that's one of the reasons our system is so expensive. Uh, recently, big press was uh, earlier this year when Citi pulled out of a bunch of Mexican banking relationships. Okay, so now harder, if you have a Citi account, you're doing more hops to get money into Mexico. That's kind of overstatement, but there's ways that this is happening. It happens every single day. 
So I think, I, I hate the term unbanked and underbanked. I find these terms to be not, I don't like them. I like the term historically We excluded. don't actually want people to have to go to banks. I, I just don't think, <laughs> I think, I think it just, exactly. I think it presumes that there's something about that system that is amazing. And I'm like, I don't know, really, is it? I'm not so sure. I, I was a person who was 22 trying to get a bank account. I'm a person now who's not 22, <laughs> a little older than that, you know, who doesn't have problems getting access to bank accounts. But I've, see, I've experienced all of that. So to me, I, I like the term historically excluded people. Because I think that we have to uh, assign intention and deliberateness and say the reason that our systems don't work for people is because of deliberate decisions that were made. Now again, I think as I, Juan Benet actually was saying earlier in his presentation, like who said it, uh, you know, it's not that these people are necessarily malicious, it's that they are taking rational actions based on how they understand regulations and they're, they're, they're viewing some transactions as being more risky than others and they are therefore declining to serve those transactions. Nevertheless, there is intentionality and action that's happening. This is not accidental, right? So it's important to understand that. Now, the beauty of the systems that many of us in this room are designing and supporting is that you don't have to worry about that kind of thing because you're engaging in a wallet to wallet transaction. So the hops, there's one hop, there's not 4,000 hops that are going on. At every stage you don't have an actor that can decide, oh, nope, I'm going to cut off this quarter now, just kidding, can't do it this way. Right? So I forget what your question was, Kristen, because I get startled about this topic. But I think it's just important to understand that we have a system today, a legacy system and operation that is not serving most people very well. It's not like it's serving everybody and a, a couple of people are left out of it or a minority. It's really not serving most people very well. So I like the term barely banked. Right? There are an awful lot of people. Me at 22, I was barely, I was clinging to this system. Like, please don't kick me out of the system. Right? I was worried every time about overdraft fees or this or that. And that's a significant portion of the population, including here in the United States. Can I just throw in two points? Please do. So first of all, on this concept of de-risking, which is the term you use for financial institutions that decide to exclude certain customers, even though they are not legally required to do so. De-risking is a massive problem, and not just in the US. This is a really big problem for NGOs overseas who get excluded just because, again, the bank is afraid, or not just afraid, but that the compliance costs are so high that as a business matter, it's not worth it to them to provide those services because they have to do heightened due diligence, so it just becomes too expensive. This is a really big problem. It's also a problem that we experience in the crypto industry ourselves. So most crypto companies have bank accounts at multiple banks just because they don't know at any moment when some bank might decide this company is too high risk for us, or hey, we're banks. We don't really like what's going on in crypto. Maybe if we kick all these people out, it'll benefit us in some way. And this is true for individuals as well. There was a story recently of a CEO of a decentralized centralized finance project who had his account closed with two weeks notice and no reason given at all. But presumably it was just because he had money that was related to crypto and the bank didn't like it. So this is something that we deal with every single day and it has a real impact, not just on us, but on a lot of people. Um, the second thing I wanted to add was we tend to focus a lot on these US um, people who are trying to get access to the banking system. And that's you know natural because that's where we are, we're US experts, but there are people all over the world who are being excluded from their local banking system or financial system, not just because the banking system thinks it's too high risk, but because the banking system is controlled by the government and the government decides that those people are not worthy of access to financial services. So if you are a Uyghur Muslim in China, you absolutely do not have access to the financial system. It's not because of a risk calculus, it's because the government is trying to commit a genocide against that group of people. And that is why I think to go back again to what Jillian was saying, that is why decentralization matters so much because the Filecoin protocol is not going to exclude anyone based on where they're from or what they look like or what they believe or what they do for a living and that is extremely important. I'll just give one more example that's very real time. So um, I am now the CEO of the Crypto Council for Innovation. I've been in the role for a month. And setting up payroll, pretty straightforward when we're dealing with dollar denominated you know, currency. Uh, trying to set up payroll to get paid in crypto. <laughs> Try DNO insurance. I mean, okay, it's crazy. It, it's really, really crazy the amount of hoops you have to jump through to get a portion of your payroll set up in crypto. So we have yet to find a, a general provider that is actually has on their roadmap over the next six months inclusion of crypto. When I spoke to the CEO of these companies, who's a friend, I was like, "Where's your roadmap to this? I know you want to do it." And he said, "We got a phone call from one of our major banks. We bank a lot of startups, and startups tend to use one bank in Silicon Valley that I will not name at the moment." And 
And that bank has said, if you, if any payment, a payroll provider uh, provides payroll and crypto and gets that opportunity, we will shut off all of our relationships with that provider. Which means that that service provider who makes all their money on providing payroll for a variety of different startups and other organizations will not be able to engage with that bank right, if they are providing crypto outside of that banking, that banking relationship. So it's a very, very real problem that applies um, to organizations all across our ecosystem. And that doesn't even get into the complexities around doing this in other parts of the world. Yeah, no, I, I mean, just to like complain about our crypto problems over here. No, it's but it's a problem with insurance for directors and office insurance right. insurance. And then for my I have a, a side business and I wanted to use QuickBooks's bookkeeping service to help me figure out how to use QuickBooks. And they said that they couldn't help me because I had a nexus to crypto. And I was like, this is like Three hundred dollars. I want to give you to show me how to use QuickBooks, and they like wouldn't even do it. So it, it, it but there's ripple effects beyond, and um, it's obviously like problematic in the crypto world. But there, there are people who are far greater need that are shut off by higher powers. And um, but yeah, it goes back to what everything Juan was saying before, and how how important it is that we get this right. Um, let's see. Jake, do you want to give a little bit of an update? Um, I mean, I'm actually super excited this week because we had a pretty good week in Washington. <laughs> um, we, we've got s at least a little window of time where we don't have to worry about like a massive crackdown for maybe the first time ever. But do you want to talk a little bit about the executive order and some of the questions that have been laid out and some of the opportunities we have to engage with government? Sure. So I, I guess to set the stage a little bit. Um, until literally a week ago, there was not a national strategy, no top-down approach to crypto regulation in the United States. We had hoped for years that we were going to get something like that. Every time a new president was elected, we would hope, okay, maybe this president is going to have a national strategy. It didn't happen with President Trump. It hadn't happened yet with President Biden until last week. So finally, after however many years of crypto existing, we have a real approach from the president of how to address regulation in this space. So President Biden put out an executive order, rather long, fairly comprehensive, that calls for, I think, 28 different federal agencies to conduct studies on a huge variety of different topics related to crypto. Uh, the executive order was framed, I think, very positively. It recognized the promise of the technology while also doing a really reasonable job of flagging some of the risks and some of the issues we need to address. Um, there are, I think, six main issues that the executive order goes after. I hope I remember them. Um, there is consumer protection, systemic risk, uh, illicit finance risk, competitiveness, uh, innovation, and financial inclusion. So these are sort of the six categories. Hey, I remembered, all right, um, that the <laughs> executive order wants to look at. The sort of seventh big issue that the executive order calls for studies on is a central bank digital currency. So this would be a digital dollar that would be created by the United States government, presumably by the Fed. And unlike US dollar stable coins, which are you know, billions of dollars in, in volume now, which are created by the private sector and have some privacy guarantees, it seems that a central bank digital currency would be under the total and complete control of the government. So at all times, the government would know what you are spending, where you are spending on it. They could program the central bank digital currency. So they could put in restrictions that say, you are only allowed to spend these dollars in these certain places, but not in those other places. They could freeze accounts or take money out of accounts at any time. I think to all of us sitting on this stage, this sounds like a totalitarian nightmare. Um, it sounds like the kind of thing that China would do and indeed is what China is doing. And our hope, I think, to, not to speak for everyone here, but hopefully this is accurate, our hope is that when the government does this study, and it is a good thing for the government to study this issue, but hopefully the conclusion they will reach is we will not compete against China, an authoritarian dictatorship, by also also acting like an authoritarian dictatorship. Instead, we will empower our private sector to come up with competitive solutions. That's always how we win these geopolitical battles. So hopefully that's how this study will come out. Um, but I guess to wrap up the EO, really positive. A lot of people were afraid there were going to be really harsh restrictions that were imposed by the president in the executive order. There was nothing like that. So I think we're really happy that there's going to be um, a real hearing for the future of crypto in, in the United States uh, in DC. Yeah, no, I think it's good to have study and observation and discussion and 
a period of education before we jump to conclusions about about what we need. But um, but I do want to stick on the topic of CB, CBDCs for a second. Um, Sheila, I know you've thought a lot about this. Any thoughts about a CBDC? Is it good? Is it bad? Can it be done in a way that protects privacy? Or is this a, a bad path? And then Jillian and Marta, if you have any thoughts on that, you feel free to chime yeah, in as well. 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 I'll start by saying everything is possible in theory. So yes, it is theoretically possible to build a CBDC that is not a surveillance tool. That is certainly possible. Is that likely is a very different question. Uh, and so I, I, think, I think it's worth noting that the chair of the Fed, Jay Powell, has come out repeatedly and said publicly, you know, he doesn't necessarily see a use case here. And that's something that I, I do think is reflected in a number of the different branches of the Fed that have done their own independent investigations. Uh, I do think that the most likely use case for CBDC will wind up being a wholesale, what we call wholesale CBDC, which is used as a bank-to-bank -bank tool, not, a, not retail CBDC, which means like you and I and everybody are able to kind of use a, CB, a digital dollar to pay for things. But who knows, and the study will come out and kind of assess, you know, what makes the most sense. But thus far, the investigations done by the Fed don't necessarily find tremendous value in a widespread rollout of a digital dollar, and we'll have to see what, what comes down. Um, I do, th there are obviously design choices that come up in, in any case, and China is a, an extreme example of very intentional surveillance built into the system. What I think is not understood about, about the, the ECNY, it's called, the, the internal project in China is called ECNY, uh, that is currently being used within Chinese borders. Again, how do you define Chinese borders? It depends who you are, so it's very important to note that. Uh, but it's now starting to be used externally outside of China. Um, there's already been expansion into Myanmar, and I think it's a matter of time before we see the African Investment Corridor and BRI, the Belt Road Initiative, uh, be completely taken over um, by uh, the Chinese digital yuan. Um, and there's a lot of concern about that for reasons I hope are fairly obvious from civil liberties perspective and surveillance perspective uh, by the United States and other governments that are opposed to that. Uh, do I think rolling out digital dollar in response to China as a different tool that will have different kinds of surveillance is the right thing? <laughs> but I also think that there's value in a, a a panoply of digital currency options. So I've always thought that a CBDC, a stable coin, and crypto all have a role to play. They have very different use cases. I personally see much more use case for crypto than I do for a CBDC, you know, but we're gonna have to kind of wait and see. And the hope is that the Fed will be quite influential in the report that comes out and that there'll be kind of, that reason will prevail <laughs> as, as it tends to do, I think, um, ultimately, even though after hard fought battles by many of us. <laughs> All right, well, we have a little over five minutes left. Um, Jillian, why don't we go back to you? Um, so where do we go from here? Are, are cryptocurrencies like the answer to our su financial surveillance concerns? Is, is this the path forward? Or what do we need to be thinking about as we look ahead and try to maintain a world where privacy is still a value? Sure. Yeah, I'm just gonna I'm gonna tell a real personal story real quick. Um, something that Sheila had, had touched on and that connects back to what I said. Um, thinking about just sort of the ways that that the traditional financial sector is regulated. Um, I was gonna share this before, but a few years ago I was doing a fundraiser for uh, for Syrian refugees. This was around 2014, 2015, and PayPal cut off my account. Um, and it was algorithmic. It wasn't actually a, a case of law, you know, legal kind of overreach, but it was rather the, literally some, some terms in there got me kicked off. Um, I had to fight to get back on. I eventually did. Long story short, um, I think that this is, you know, a really, really strong reason why we have to stop relying on these financial intermediaries, um, why we need to look to the future of, you know, what else is out there? Is cryptocurrency always going to be the answer? I'm not sure. It's not actually my expertise. Um, but at the same time, you know, I... I do feel really strongly that this provides a new sense of privacy and, and freedom to users. Um, and so, you know, I guess my one thing that I would say to those who are working on this um, is to focus on usability and bringing this to a broader swath of people. Because right now, I'm, I live in Germany, and coming from the international perspective, a lot of it does feel kind of out of reach to a lot of ordinary folks. Um, so that's where I would put my energy if I were working in this space. Uh, Marta, any final parting thoughts for this group as we wrap up? Um, you know, I, I would really go back to, I think, uh, the, the very beginning, which is just to say, um, I really do think that, you know, when I saw the EO and the, uh, the question around CBDCs, uh, fundamentally what we're talking about is a cashless society, um, which, as I said at the beginning, I think is a surveillance society. Um, so I think it's really important, and now is the moment for us to be really thinking about the future of our civil liberties and, and how cryptocurrency is going to play a role in that. Sheila? 
I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think that we have to be ever watchful about what's happening. I agree that the EO is a tremendous step in the right direction. It's introduced nuance into the conversation where previously a lot of policymakers were taking black and white positions, pro or anti crypto, and they really can't do that with this new directive that's come down from the administration. So I'm really hopeful about it, but it deserves a lot of our attention. All right, Jake. You have a maximum of four minutes. Oh, wow, okay. Well, I probably won't use all of that. Um, I guess the, the last thing I want to mention that we haven't touched on much here is we focused on financial surveillance from the perspective of governments surveilling transactions. We've not talked about the other surveillance issue, which is surveillance capitalism. Governments are not the only bad, pot potentially bad actors that could overreach in terms of surveillance. And we've lived this in the last decade or so where we've realized these intermediaries that have the power to surveil us and collect data about us can do just as much damage as any other type of actor here. So you don't have to be an anarchist or a libertarian or anything like that to care about privacy. What matters here is not just stopping law enforcement from uh, you know, going after undesirables in a way that we find distasteful. It's about stopping the um, sort of new development of tools and technologies by big tech companies that they use to enrich themselves at the expense of the people that they call their customers or their users, but who are actually, in many cases, their victims. So that's why privacy matters so much more than just from the perspective of the government could be bad. So I think this is a really, really important issue. Right. Great. Um, well, thank you, everyone. We really appreciate um, all your time and for traveling here to Austin today. And Marta, thank you, too, for the Filecoin Foundation's commitment to educating on the decentralized web. And I think it's clear by the packed house here that uh, this is an effort uh, well undertaken. So thank you for your leadership. And thank you, Sheila, Jillian, and Jake, um, and appreciate everyone's time today.